This is the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast, presented by Massage Envy, the first podcast devoted entirely to Arkansas baseball. Featuring insight from Arkansas baseball color analyst Bubba Carpenter. Here's Matt Jones. The Ragebacks just keep winning. They've won 13 straight SEC series after a series victory over Mississippi State last week. They'll go to Florida this week, try to make it 14 in a row. That's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday series in Gainesville. The Ragebacks next two series are going to be Thursday through Saturday series. They'll play LSU next week at Baumwalker Stadium. Matt Jones with Bubba Carpenter. And we usually start with the series from last weekend, but with uh, what happened in the midweek this week, we'll start off with the UCA game. And in particular, Bubba, what Dylan Leach did, it's rare to see a player hit for the cycle. Dave Van Horn said he's never seen a player hit a home run from both sides of the plate. And when you look at what Dylan Leach had done leading up to the UCA game, he was one for 22 going into it. A five for five performance, five runs batted in. Just an incredible night that I don't think he'll ever forget. I don't think so, Matt. And, it, you know, you got to really pull for for Dylan Leach. You know, what he did last night was just remarkable. Uh, he comes to the field every day, works hard. You know, he has been getting a lot of catching time on the weekends. You know, midweek games have been getting canceled and rained out. And so he hasn't had a lot of opportunity. And he got off to a slow start on top of all that. And so for him to come out and do what he did last night, well, you just you get so excited for a guy when he does something like that. And uh, and I know he works really hard. And so, so he deserves it. But to see what he did, it's, it's amazing. You know, I mean, you don't. The, the cycle alone is awesome, but then to hit the home run after that kind of kind of put an exclamation point with a home run from the other side of the plate. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Have you ever seen anyone hit a home run from both sides of the plate in person? Yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it done, but never with a cycle for sure. You know, but I'll tell you, Matt, even though even though the cycle's awesome, I, one of the best plays I thought the whole night was when he did the slug bunt. I really did. It's a, that's a play where they were, they were trying to sack bunt. Uh, the corners were crashing and I'm pretty sure DVH gave him the green light. If the corners crash, pull back and, and slug bunt. And that's a play you don't see executed very often. Now the Razorbacks work on it in BP all the time, but, and I know it sounds silly. The guy went five for five with a cycle and two home runs. And this is what I'm talking about, but it's the little things like that, that we do, but he ended up pulling the bat back the corners were crashing. If he'd have bunted, he'd have bunted it. They'd have fielded it, thrown it to third. Uh, hit, ended up hitting a triple down the right field line. That was his first hit of the night. And I, I just thought that was amazing, the way he started off the night. And then it go on from there, you know, a sack bunt single, you know, then, you know, we all know what happened after that, the double, the home, then the two home runs. But it was it was an amazing night. But I'm really happy for him. I texted him after the game and said, congratulations, man. You're proud of you. You know, you earned it. So, uh just a just a great night. Arkansas beat UCA twenty one to nine. The Razorbacks had nineteen hits in that game, and but but fourteen of those nineteen hits were for extra bases. They had four doubles, three triples, uh, three triples. That's a season high, and they also hit a season high seven home runs against the Bears. That game last night, just one performance, raised their slugging percentage by thirty two points to four ninety two, and. You, know, you look back over what they've done at home over the last five games. Uh, this is a team that seems like they're really comfortable hitting at home. I mean, uh, I've got it written down here, 60 runs, 58 hits over these last five games at home. Now, I know the, the competition isn't the best. They played UALR last week, played Mississippi State three times and UCA uh, on Tuesday night. But in those five games, Bubba, if I, if I have my numbers right here, that's 19 home runs they've hit over these last five games. They seem like they really enjoy playing at home. And that's a big deal when you think about, you know, getting one of those top eight national seeds and never having to leave Bomb Walker Stadium before you go to Omaha. Uh, that, that could be a real key for this team moving forward. Oh, I think so. It's a huge advantage. You know, as a hitter, when you step up to the plate, your, your batter's box feels different at home than it does on the road. It's just a different feel. Now, we know when we go to places like Columbia – what that feels like on the turf, uh, but just something about being in your home ballpark, you're familiar with the batter's eye. For me, it's about the batter's eye and the way I feel standing at home plate, looking out towards the mound and what's beyond that. And our hitters are just comfortable there. Well, you can see, and there were so many things that happened last night. You think about the seven home runs, the three triples, we saw back-to-back -back triples. 
Uh, we saw three stand-up triples, which you don't see very often. You saw a runner score, a sack fly, score two runners. Uh, Robert Moore from second on Brady Slavin's uh, sack fly to center. I mean, there were just so many things. Borfin had two home runs. He really had a third one because it got robbed. Uh, there was just a lot of things that happened last night in the game, and it was a long game. And I know a lot of people are saying, wow, it was a long game. It was here forever. But I thought it was awesome. And Phil and I had a ton of fun in the booth just watching – just the things that happen and that's baseball you see things that you never happen before it seems like it always happens you go to the ballpark you see something you've never seen before and we we saw some of that last night it was a lot of fun yeah that's kind of what makes the sports fun is you, you never know what you're going to get you go there thinking uh, this is Arkansas UCA this isn't going to be that great of a matchup and, and like you said it was like a Halloween bag with all the different things that you saw oh it is and look I like the in-state games you know uh, UCA's got 18 Arkansas kids on their roster so a lot of these kids I've got to see come up and kind of grow up in the state of Arkansas playing baseball whether it be showcase or U triple SA you know so I know a lot of these kids I'm familiar with their names I've seen them play and so for me it's a lot of fun getting to see other other players play uh, that I've watched grow up and see on this on a on a big stage like this and so it was a lot of fun but just like you said so many things happened last night it seemed like it was just every inning something else you're like wow look at that it was an impressive night and and I'm an offensive guy I love I love to see the offense but I also enjoyed seeing the guys come out of the pen you know they haven't got to see pitch in a while and see them throw up there on the mound and so a lot a lot of things to be excited about last night. There are some great defensive plays. You mentioned the home run, Rob, by UCA. Caden Wallace made a really great barehanded throw from third base. We'll talk more about the Razorbacks defense here in a little bit. Uh, let's go back to the Mississippi State series, though. Arkansas wins the first two games of that series, 8-1 to one and 12-5. to five. They end it with a little bit of a sour note, losing in 12 innings to the Bulldogs on Sunday. And I thought in that Sunday game, Mississippi State, you know, you look at their record and – it's like, how are they, how do they have a record like this when they have talent like that? Now, I know they've had some injuries to their, their pitching staff and in, in particular to Landon Sims, their, their ace, but they just looked like a really good focused, hungry team on Sunday. And, you know, I, I talked to Dave Van Horn about this earlier this week, Florida this weekend is going to be the first ranked team that they played in SEC play this season. But when you look at Mississippi State and the talent they have. You look at Missouri and, you know, they beat South Carolina the week after Arkansas came up there to Columbia. Uh, we mentioned last week about what Kentucky did by going down and beating Georgia uh, or beating Georgia at home the, the week after Arkansas played them. Uh, the, the teams that Arkansas has played, they're a lot better than I think people probably realize because they're not ranked. I think so. And, and when Kentucky came to town, I thought they played like a tired team. Their defense wasn't very good, but you could tell they had a lot of potential in their lineup. They had some guys that could swing and our pitching staff just shut them down. You know, we go to Mizzou, kind of the same things. Defense was kind of sloppy, but I was really impressed. They were better than I thought they were going to be. thought we were lucky to come away with a series win. And then Mississippi State comes to town. And, and I made a comment to Caden Wallace. He was player of the game after Saturday's game. And I said, Hey, I'm really surprised with the, with the pitching staff of, of Mississippi state. I kind of thought they'd be a little bit better. They were walking a lot of guys, you know, I just expected a little bit more. And he's like, honestly, Bubba, he said, he said, they're good. He said, we're just having really good at bats. And, and he's right. You know what they, we, we had some really good at bats. I first two th games, we had 19 walks, 16 hits. Um, and that was a lot. And there weren't like a lot of non-competitive at bats where they were like four pitch walks. I mean, they were walks where we're, we're working to count three, two fouling off some pitches. We either get a hit or draw the walk and they were just good at bats. And so we really put pressure on, on the starting pitching of Mississippi state. And, and it really showed And, and you're right, Matt, they're, they're a good team. And what's crazy is you lose that game on Sunday and you're like, wow, you know, it sucks. We're, we, we won the series, but we should have swept. Well, if we lose Friday night and then win the next two, everyone's all excited. Oh, we won the series. But since, since you lose that game on Sunday, it just kind of leaves a bad taste in your mouth because you feel like, boy, this sweep was right there. We almost had it. Arkansas walked 27 times during the three games against Mississippi State. They walked 11 times in the game Friday. That tied with the Grambling State game uh, for the most walks that Arkansas has taken in a game this season. Kind of surprising to see Mississippi State and Grambling State pitching mentioned in the same breath. Uh, let's start with that Friday night game. Arkansas wins eight to one. You know, really the, the story of that game was Arkansas had a six run second inning 
where they just really got after Mississippi State's Preston Johnson. Johnson ends up giving up 14 or he ends up having 14 base runners in his four innings against the Razorbacks Friday night. Keep in mind that even though Mississippi State's pitching numbers aren't great collectively as a team, Johnson's numbers weren't too bad. You know, he came in with stats that basically were uh, just like Connor Nolan. They had, they had the same ERA. They had the same number of innings. Nolan had one more decision than Johnson did, but teams were only hitting 198 against Johnson. Arkansas really put a lot of good contact against him. They took their walks. They batted really well against Preston Johnson. And, you know, that kind of goes back to what we've talked about this lineup in the past. They have a lot of potential to get on you in one inning and, and that be the difference in the game. And that was the difference in Friday night's game, that six run second. Well, you're right, Matt. And the thing is, is, is you look at Preston Johnson's number and, and they were good. Like you said, 198 batting average against. We just put together pure at bats all night. We, we didn't give away an at bat. We didn't give away an at out. And that's what this, this lineup is capable of doing that from top to bottom. And Dave Van Horn said early in the season, he said, look, this is going to be a lineup that's going to battle you top to bottom. And, and we're going to scratch and claw. We're going to get a, a pitcher's pitch count up. And that's what they did Friday night. I mean, it was impressive to see some of their ABs. And, and just, you know, the pitches that we didn't swing at, you know, we laid off the pitches just out of the zone and then attacked the pitches in the zone. And I will say, you know, for all the talk, we've talked a lot about umpires. I thought Scott Klein did a really good job Friday night with his, with his strike zone. I thought he was really consistent with the strike zone. And I think that helps our hitters because we've got discipline at the plate and we do a pretty good job of staying in the zone. Scott Klein was uh, the story of Sunday. We're going to talk about him a little bit more here in a minute. On Saturday, the Razorbacks uh, beat Mississippi State 12-5. to Again, they had a, a big inning early. I think it was a four-run second inning. Uh, they had a, a big third inning. You know, over the two games Friday and Saturday, Arkansas scored 15 runs in either the second or the third innings. And they put both of those games out of reach. And, you know, it kind of felt like a laugher for the last half of each of those games. I think so. And, and – I'll tell you who came up big Saturday was Brady Slavens. You know, Brady set out on Friday night. He came back in. And a lot of times Dave Van Orn talks about you know, just letting a guy sit for a game or two and just kind of slow the game down. Brady came out and, and had a really good game on Saturday. He was two for four with three RBIs. You know, had a home run, uh, took a couple of pitches, took a, took a slider over the right field fence. And it was a pitch that a lot of times you see him roll over. He stayed inside and hit it over the fence. I just thought he had a really good game. Uh, he had a, he had a double to left center. It was a fastball down and away. And once again, it's a pitch that he has a tendency to get around and pull and ground second base. He stayed on the ball, drove it to left center for a double. Uh, he hit that ball 104. And if you look at where that was in the strike zone, I mean, it was a tough pitch down and away in the zone. He kept it on the ball and drove that ball to left center. So you know, I was impressed with Brady Slavens being back in the lineup. And he 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 adds a lot to this lineup. And for, for you look at what we did, you know, Friday and Saturday, Matt, we, we're still not clicking on all cylinders when this lineup starts to click uh, we're we're going to be scary Dave Van Horn at Swatters Club this week said that he thought that looked like Brady that looked like the Brady Slavens that they were used to seeing and I thought really Bubba one of the key at bats for him was in the second inning of Saturday's game he took a four pitch walk against Parker Stinnett and what he did was he laid off a lot of the pitches that have been giving him trouble in those games beforehand I mean you know before he sat out for three games he had had 17 at bats where he had 10 strikeouts and he'd gone hitless in five games. I thought it was a, a really good sign for him to be able to take a walk before he got a hit in that game and be able to lay off some of those pitches that he hadn't been able to in the weeks before. I think so. And, and the pitch that he laid off of that three, two pitch was a slider down just out of the zone. It was a really good pitch and, and he laid off of it and, and hitters are defined by what they don't swing at. And, and Brady did a good job this weekend laying off those pitches that you don't want to swing at and then getting pitches that you can hit and attacking them. He did a great job, so it was good to see him back in the lineup and, and kind of rolling. Like I said, anyone can pull a ball to right field and hit it over the fence, over that building. That's, that's not hard to do when you get your pitch. I think I'm impressed with a guy that will take that fastball and, and stay on it, that pitcher's pitch down and away and drive that thing to left center. Uh, that's really, you know, th that really impressed me to see him do that. And then on Sunday's game, he did the same thing, got a slider down and away, didn't try to pull it, just got a base hit up the middle, ended up being a big hit in the game. You said anyone could hit it over the building. You think I could? 
Okay. Almost <laughs> anyone could. I think you could, man. You're a big boy. You get that body going. I think I think uh, I think you got a little pop in there. You haven't seen me during uh, during infield with the T ball players yet. Uh, let's go to Sunday's game against Mississippi State. Five to three, the Bulldogs win in twelve innings. Uh, you know, a lot of people are going to focus on the lineup or on on the offense and say that wasn't a very good game by either team. You know, the the first five runs in the games were solo home runs. Arkansas had a couple of solo home runs. Braden Webb had one. Zach Gregory had one to the opposite field. Mississippi State hit three solo home runs. In the sixth inning, Arkansas ties it uh, when they basically manufacture a run with with Chris Lanzilli, move him over on the bases, and he scores on a sacrifice fly. But I thought that it was a, a really fun game to be at. Uh, number one, a lot of drama. These are two teams that you know that, you know, obviously are, are very familiar with each other. You know, two really talented teams that get to Omaha quite a bit. But I thought that both teams pitched really well. Cade Smith, for me, for Mississippi State, I thought he looked like their Sunday – or he, he was their Sunday starter. I thought he looked like he should be their Friday starter. And this wasn't your typical Sunday pitching matchup. It wouldn't surprise me at all if you see Cade Smith going against Jackson Wiggins on a Friday night next year in Starkville. Arkansas has Wiggins on the mound. Zebulon Vermillion gives him a good inning out of the bullpen. Uh, Brady Tiger, just phenomenal. Three and two-third innings. He strikes out the first six batters. And you know, you wonder what kind of outing that he's going to have because he's a Mississippi kid, grew up just south of Memphis and Olive Branch. And, you know, I know that he knows a lot of those Mississippi State players. And he was he was phenomenal for three and two-third innings. Uh, Mississippi State, they, they get really good uh, outings out of their bullpen. You know, and the other thing that stood out to me, Bubba, about Sunday's game was just the maneuvering by each coaching staff, whether it be the shifts. We saw really, really defined shifts by both teams. Dave Van Horn said that he thinks the shift probably took away five of their hits against Mississippi State on Sunday. Uh, you know, and, and then you just saw a lot of great back and forth in those late innings. You know, Arkansas, they bun a runner over. Uh, to bring up Caden Wallace and Mississippi State, they intentionally walk Wallace, go to the bullpen, get a matchup with a couple of hitters, Peyton Stovall and Michael Turner from the left side, and, and they can't get it done in the ninth inning. It was like that throughout those late innings, just back and forth, a really, really great performance, I thought, by both teams, even though the offensive numbers wouldn't necessarily say that. Well, it's not a typical Sunday day in the, in the SEC. Usually that Sunday game is kind of crazy offensively. But you're right. It's you. You look at Jackson Wiggins and Cade Smith. They're both. They could both be Friday night guys if you look at their numbers. And I thought Cade Smith had the best, the best stuff of any of the guys we saw this weekend. I thought he had really good stuff. Um, he just his fastball, his slider, his change. I like his quick arm action. The ball jumps out of his hands. Uh, I, th I thought he looked really good. But if you're a baseball fan, you had to have loved that game. You know whether or not the Razorbacks won or not. I mean, just. You don't see a, a game with that many sack bunts in it these days. I mean, we we sacrificed bunted four times. Uh, we typically you don't see a runner bunted from first to second, but we did times in the game. You know, more so, it's it's runner at first and second. You bunt them over to second and third. But you know, there were several times. Even, even our four hole hitter, uh, Lanzilli, laid down a perfect bunt, uh, and that was in the eighth inning. Uh, to move runners over. Now, we ended up not scoring him, but we, he moved that runner from first to second on a sack bun. And so it's something you don't spot in today's game. I, I'm a big fan of, of strategic baseball. I still like to see all the strategy involved in it where every pitch is so crucial. And, and so if you're a fan of baseball, you had to have loved that game on Sunday. When it doesn't work out, you're going to get second-guessed about bunting. And Van Horn you know, mentioned that earlier this week. He said it, it didn't work out for him, you know, obviously. But, you know, I think that most baseball coaches are going to do what he did late in that game where it's a tie game. You're not getting a whole lot of hits. And so you're going to do everything you can to move your runners up and, and put them in a position where a single might win the game, a wild pitch might win you the game. I think most baseball coaches are going to do what he did in that situation with the bunning. And I thought it was the right call, even though you know it, it did take the bat out of the hands of some of their better hitters, Zach Gregory and Caden Wallace in particular. Uh, the one, and, and look, I'm not second guessing Dave Van Horn at all. Uh, I'm not, the, the, the Lanzilli bunt, I didn't like the Lance Zilli bunt. He's a, he hits sliders really he was a slider guy on the mound uh, who was on the mound for them. Auger Brooks Auger was on the mound at the time. Lance Zilli had already had a base hit on him. Uh, we get a leadoff hit. 
Turner gets on and we we bunted Michael Turner to second with Lanzilli. That's the only one I wasn't a big fan of just because I know the matchup there. But the thing about Dave Van Horn, it makes him so awesome. And, and I say it all the time, Matt, you kind of to be a good coach, you got to kind of coach from the inside out. You got to know what's inside a kid and you got to know your lineup and know your players and, and know what they're capable of. And, and, and Dave really believes in his lineup, you know, as it turns out, you know, Robert Moore, Braden Webb weren't able to get it done and drive my, but I'm not second guessing Dave. I'm just saying that was, that was one that was a tough one, but you know, it, a lot of times it works out. I just, uh, I like that matchup with Lanzilli facing, the slider guy because he hits sliders really well. Uh, he's a good mistake hitter uh, when it comes to that slider. But that was the only one. Um, if you look at the percentages, all your all your people out there analytically will say that sacrificing a runner from first to second decreases your chance. There's a better chance of him scoring from first with no outs than there is of him scoring from second with one out. Now. But in, and you just don't know. Like I said, it comes down to your players and uh, who you've got and the situation and your matchups. I don't know how it's a tough it's a tough thing to really analyze without having all the variables in there, like who's on the mound, who's hitting and all the situations. But uh, it didn't work. But, uh, hey, you know, next time I bet it does. People are going to second guess if he doesn't bunt there. What, what if Zach Gregory strikes out? What if he grounds into a double play? Then people, well, why didn't you bunt? You know, it's it's just the nature it's the nature of sports, uh, you know, and, and I thought it was, I thought Peyton Stovall did his job in the 11th inning. He just smoked a line drive right to where the first baseman was standing. The first baseman, Luke Hancock, who had a great game, uh, you know, in the field and at the plate, made a great catch and doubled up Jalen Battles at second base. And that's just how it works sometimes. You know, the, the other team just makes the winning plays. And I thought Mississippi State made the winning plays on Sunday. I think so. Hey, one more thing about the Lancelli. Punt. Another thing that could have weighed into Dave Van Horn's decision is Lance really hits a lot of hard balls to the left side. Well, it's a double play candidate. So if he doesn't bunt him in the eighth inning, he rolls over into a double play, then you're right. The naysayers are going to be like, well, why didn't you bunt him there? So you can't win for losing in this game. There's always the what ifs. You know, what if this happened? What if this happened? You know, why didn't you do this? You can go back and, and second guess a ton of things in baseball. And that's what makes it awesome is so many little decisions and little bitty plays make a difference in a game. And so, you know, I think that was something else on the Lancilli thing that, that, that could have been a factor there, but back to what you said about Peyton Stovall, that was a great at bat. He came up in a situation before with the bases loaded one out and struck out. And I tell you what, he went up this at bat, made it an adjustment, got a slider kind of, I call it staying on the tracks. He, he stayed on the tracks, kept his barrel inside the ball and smoked that ball right at the first baseman. But hey, credit Hancock. He made a good play. It was a heads up play uh, through the second, got the double play. And it, and I tell you, Matt, if that ball from my vantage point, I was, I'm looking directly at it from the booth. If that ball's a foot either way, he doesn't make that catch. Mm -hmm. It gets by him, but it just happened to be right at him. And boy, when he hit it, I thought for sure that ball was destined for the right field line and we were going to get the sweep, but says so baseball. Hey, but I tell you, I, I think that was a, a huge at bat for Peyton Stovall right there. I'd say a foot either way, right or left, or maybe even just five inches higher off of his bat. It goes into the right field and, and they win that game. Dave Van Horn said when he hit it, Game over. That's what he that's what he told everybody in the dugout. He said two seconds later, he's in shock because the game's going on into the 12th inning. And and I think that might have been why you saw Arkansas give up some of those runs in the 12th inning. I wonder, do you think that there are going to be or that there's going to be a change in the lineup uh, at some point moving forward? You know, Peyton Stovall, he went over 13 in the two hole against Mississippi State. Braden Webb has been hitting really well down in the order. Uh, I wonder if you think that we might see some things shift as, as we go into this Florida series. You see this a lot of times throughout the season. You never really see the same lineup from the beginning of the season to the end. There's always some maneuvering in there. And it seems like even though they've had some success offensively, maybe it's time to uh, to see a, a shift in the lineup. They did it against UCA last night. Move Braden Webb up in the order, Peyton Stovall down. I wonder if you think that we might see that in a conference game. I think we might – not that they've lost confidence in Peyton Stovall. We know he can hit. He's going to hit. He's going to be a stud. 
they may drop him down a little bit just to just to take a little pressure off of him. You see DVH do that a lot. There's a lot of guys you could jump up into that two hole. You could put Braden Webb there. You could put Robert Moore back up there with his on base percentage. Robert Moore's on base percentage right now is 447. You know, you could throw him in the two hole. You know, Robert's a guy that can can drive in runs or he can get on base. He's a table setter. He can do whatever you need him to do. And and the way the bottom of the lineup's been getting on base, it, it really doesn't matter. What that after that first time through the lineup. You know, you look at uh, Caden Wallace has had a ton of RBI opportunities in that leadoff spot just because the bottom of the lineup is doing such a good job of getting on base. So I don't, I wouldn't be surprised if DVH does that. But then, you know, they have a lot of faith in in Peyton Stovall. They might leave him in the two hole and kind of leave things as as they are right now and just roll with it. I'm glad you said that. I wanted to mention Zach Gregory and just the performance that he's been having lately. Uh, he is he is a pitcher's worst nightmare i feel like he's going to drive up your pitch count he's going to crowd the plate he's going to make you throw strikes uh, if you leave it over the middle of the plate he's got the power where he can crush it he hit two home runs against mississippi state really good base runner he can steal bases he goes first to third really well it's it's he's really just kind of that he's not a prospect uh, professionally but he's just that really really solid college baseball player that your team is really happy they have, and the other team kind of stresses them out, I think, to, to face a player like that. And one other note on Gregory, I think his defense is getting a lot better since they moved him from center to left field. We talked about that. He's not really a traditional center fielder, but he does play a pretty good corner outfield, and I thought he made a great throw the other day whenever he chased the ball down near the fence, and he almost threw out a runner at second on what looked like it shouldn't have even been a play at all. Well, you're right about Zach. He's the kind of guy, if – if you're playing against him, you hate him. But if he's on your team, he's your favorite player because he's just he's just a baseball player. He's kind of a dirt bag. He's always dirty. He's always scrappy. He's in the middle of the action. And he finds a way. I love, I love the at bats he puts together. Now, every once in a while, he'll he'll jump that first pitch and crush it. But most of the time he's patient. He works the count. He really waits for that pitcher to make a mistake. And, and, and guys try to bust him in, and he's right on top of the plate. He'll take that pitch in the shoulder and go to first base, and uh, he just finds a way to get on base. And uh, he's, he's really a lot of fun to watch to watch play. I loved his, his energy and his emotion when he hit the home run the other night to left field. I thought that was, that was awesome, watching him run around the bases. And it's just another reason why I love college baseball so much, just the passion, the energy, and the love of the game that these guys show out there on the field. And, boy, it's just fun to sit there and watch it up in the booth every night, Matt. And I wanted to mention Braden Webb. He started the season 0 for 23. Since then, Bubba, he is 17 for 41 with seven home runs and 19 RBI. I haven't looked this up, but I, I have a feeling that if you, especially if you took some minimum at bat counts into consideration, he had the worst batting average of any Razorback against non-conference opponents, and he's got the best batting average of any Razorback against SEC. Well, it goes back to what uh, Robert Moore said in, in the interview. You asked him about, <laughs> about about struggling a little bit. And he said, "What? how did he say it? Uh, the players show up when, when SEC when, play starts. That's, that's, right. that's when the real players show up. Something, something to that effect. I'm probably messing up that quote. But, hey, uh, Brain's just a primetime player. But it goes to show you the, how important the, the mental side of the game is and, and how it can have a huge effect. Early in the year, Braden was trying so hard just to – it's almost looked like he was fighting, you know, loading to see if he wanted to hit versus loading to hit. Now he's a hitter up there loading to hit. And, boy, pitcher makes a mistake. He hammers it. He got that first pitch changeup last night from a lefty and hit that grand slam, and that ball was hammered to left field. But he, he goes up there now, and he looks, he looks like he's getting ready to crush the ball every at-bat. That was Webb's second grand slam this season. Arkansas has four grand slams through 27 games this year. They didn't hit their fourth grand slam last year until game one of the Super Regional against North Carolina State. The Whole Hog Baseball Podcast is sponsored by Massage Envy, voted the best day spa and best massage in all of Northwest Arkansas. Visit Mike and his staff in Tuscany Square at 2603 West Pleasant Grove Road in Rogers or in Fayetteville at 3557 North Shiloh Drive. Massage Envy has services for everyone. MassageEnvy.com. Massage Envy with clinics in Rogers and Fayetteville has been awarded Northwest Arkansas's best day spa and best massage. One of the reasons is our care for athletes, 
both serious and recreational. We now offer rapid tension relief sessions using a high caliber vibrating tool and total body stretch sessions like the ones used by the PGA. Both of these new services can be combined with the always popular deep muscle treatment. So whether you compete or just want to relax, there is no place better than Massage Envy. Wholehogsports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at wholehogsports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. Wholehogsports.com. Com. You know it never goes out of style, a great burger. And for a long time now, the best burgers around have been made at CJ's Butcher Boy. I've been stopping at their Russellville location for years to enjoy a double with bacon, cheese, and all the fixings. Well, the fries are always made fresh, and their shakes are made with real premium ice cream. And now that CJ's Butcher Boy has a Fayetteville location, too, on Weddington, you can bet I'll be there a lot more. CJ's Butcher Boy in Russellville and Fayetteville. When all you do are burgers, they have to be the best. Welcome back to the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Now let's look at this week in the SEC, presented by CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers. Three weeks into the SEC season, Arkansas has a two-game lead over Auburn in the SEC West. It's going to be hard for anybody to catch Tennessee, it feels like. The Volunteers are off to a 9-0 start. Tennessee, the first team in 28 years to start the SEC season with nine straight victories. Last week's sweeps, Tennessee beat Vanderbilt three times in Nashville. Georgia also beat Florida three times in Athens. Other series last week, Ole Miss beat Kentucky 2-1. Missouri beat South Carolina 2-1. Bama beat A&M 2-1. And Auburn beat LSU 2-1. Bubba, the story that everybody was talking about after the SEC weekend was obviously Tennessee and what they did at Vanderbilt, they just look incredible right now. They outscored Vandy 16-4, to and the play that everybody was talking about was the bat controversy. When Jordan Beck hits a home run in the first inning of that game, the Vanderbilt catcher picks up the bat, looks at the sticker, says, hey, that's not the sticker from our game, uh, gives it to the umpires. He's ruled out on the play, and uh, Tony Vitello just really lost his cool after that. I wonder what your thoughts are on the whole bat situation with the Volunteers. Well, I don't know how they could let that happen. If the if it's the sticker from if it's not the right sticker on the bat, how do you let him take that bat up there and and hit with it? You know, I talked to Bobby Wernis about the whole process with the stickers and all, all that. And a, a sticker can fall off, and you've seen that happen. I think that's what happened at the A and M game the week before when a, wasn't it the Auburn hitter that had a home run taken away? I think the sticker came off the bat in that situation, and and. You know, so you you got to keep an eye on that. But how you could have the wrong sticker on there? But I tell you what, Vitello just lost it. I thought it was awesome. You could read great television. Wanted, he, oh, it was awesome. He wanted that bat from the umpire, and the umpire didn't want to give it to him. He's like, "Yeah, give me that, you know, blanking bat." <laughs> yeah. But uh, you know, it's it's one of those things you you just can't let that happen. I mean, in a in a conference series like that. Now, obviously, you could scoreboard and it didn't really have an effect. Actually, it might have just poked the bear a little bit mm-hmm. and kind of fired Tennessee up a a little bit more because you look at their win 6-2, 5-2, and 5-0. I mean, they really just dominated Vandy all weekend. I don't know if you saw, but I think in the next inning, Tennessee had a hitter come up and hit a home run, and part of his uh, home run celebration when he came back to the plate was kind of mockingly checking for the sticker on the bat. You heard Tony Vitello say during his postgame or during his uh, in-game interview against Vanderbilt, he said that they've had a few bats where the stickers come off. You think that happens during games sometimes? Like I said, I talked to Bobby Wernis about it. He said, yeah, they'll, they'll occasionally start to come off, but they, you know, they, they tell their guys to keep an eye on that and make sure that it doesn't, but they can come off. So you've just got to walk. It's up to the player, you know, to, hey, make sure, because now, you know, everyone's looking for that. And so it's, it's just another thing for those guys to, I guess, another thing for those guys to worry about uh, is making sure that sticker doesn't fall off. You'd think there'd be a little better process than that, you know, 2022. Can we not come up with a better system? Uh, we mentioned SEC standings, Tennessee 9-0 and in the East. The next closest team to them is Georgia at 6-3. and It's really kind of surprising when you look at the rest of the Eastern Division. They've all got losing records. Vanderbilt's 4-5, and Missouri's 3-6, and Florida, where Arkansas will go this weekend. The Gators are 3-6, and Kentucky, South Carolina 
are three and six and well. Uh, in the SEC West, Arkansas, as we mentioned, seven and two. They've got a two-game lead over Auburn, five and four. Everybody else with losing conference records, LSU, Ole Miss, and A&M, and Alabama are all four and five. Also, Mississippi State, four and five after that series loss to the Razorbacks. It really feels like it's a two-team race in the SEC right now, Bubba. Uh, you know, maybe Vanderbilt, they, they rebound and, and they play better down the stretch. But right now, it feels like it's Arkansas and Tennessee for that SEC title. It really does, and and it's still early, and anything can happen, but Tennessee looks like the real deal. If you look, they're leading in pretty much every category, you know, offensively, you know, pitching-wise. I mean, they're they're really good, and early on, I, I thought it was just weak competition they had played. The only good team they had really played early on was, was Texas, and they lost to Texas, but since then, they've really proven me wrong, and, and they're rolling right now, and so, you know, but the thing about the Razorbacks that gets me excited is – we're still, we're not even clicking full steam, Matt. I mean, we're offensively, we're just now getting some guys going. Uh, that lineup hasn't hasn't been 100% yet. Pitching-wise, I think we're just now starting to get the pieces in the bullpen. You know, there's still a couple of unanswered questions, but our starting pitch has been phenomenal. Um, and, and, and some of the guys in the pen, you know, you mentioned Brady Tiger, just – his stuff is ridiculous. When he came in the other night and struck out the first six batters he faced, those guys were overmatched by a freshman, and he wasn't at all by the mom, which is which is really – it's one thing to have really good stuff. It's another thing to be able to go out there on the bump and do it in an SEC series, you know, in a, in a tie game late in the game like that. And he just – I was really impressed with his composure out there and how he just, he just kind of shoved it up, you know, against Mississippi State. I think the thing that has impressed me the most about Tennessee, Bubba, we knew they were going to hit, but it's really been the way that they pitched this year that I think has been outstanding. You saw where they had a freshman, Drew Beam, throw a complete game shutout the other day against Vanderbilt. Uh, he's one of three pitchers. All three of Tennessee's starting pitchers are on the midseason watch list for the Golden Spikes Award. You've got uh, Drew Beam, the right-hander, Chase Burns is a right-hander, and of course they've got Chase Dollander, the right-hander who transferred in from Georgia Southern. That doesn't even take into consideration that they've got Blake Tidwell, who is going to be their number one pitcher, who's been battling an injury, and he's kind of coming back from that right now. He's their midweek starter, and they've got this Ben Joyce in the back of the bullpen throwing 103, 104 miles an hour. Uh, It's an incredible pitching staff that they've uh, collected there at Tennessee. I mentioned they've got three on the midseason watch list for the perfect or for the uh, Golden Spikes Award. Arkansas has got uh, Connor Nolan on there. There's 12 SEC players in all. Also on the midseason watch list is Hunter Barco, the left handed pitcher from Florida. Arkansas will see him Thursday night. LSU's got a couple of players on it Jacob Berry, uh, the infielder who transferred in from Arizona. Also Dylan Cruz, Vanderbilt with a couple of uh, position players, and Enrique Bradfield and Dominic Keegan. Also, you've got Sonny DiCaria from Auburn is on this list. Chris McElvain, a pitcher from Vanderbilt. Jonathan Cannon, a pitcher from Georgia. They're all on the midseason watch list for the Golden Spikes Award. And we'll talk more about Connor Nolan here in just a minute. This week's series, Missouri is at Tennessee. Georgia is at South Carolina. Vanderbilt's at Auburn. Kentucky is at A&M. Bama is at Ole Miss. And LSU goes to Mississippi State. It'll be really interesting to see how the Bulldogs perform this weekend. The teams that Arkansas has played in the SEC so far had a really good weekend after they played the Razorbacks. There are seven SEC teams in the coaches poll that ties the ACC for the most this week. Tennessee is number one, Arkansas is number two, Ole Miss number eight, Georgia number 10. They moved up quite a bit after that sweep of Florida. Vanderbilt fell down to number 12. They were number one two weeks ago, but they've lost two straight series. LSU is number 16 and Florida will be number 22 when the Razorbacks come to Gainesville. The SEC Report is brought to you by CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers. They're the best in two towns. Visit the original at 2803 North Arkansas Avenue in Russellville or the newest location at 3484 West Weddington Drive in Fayetteville, just minutes from the ballpark. Skip the line and order online or download the app in your app store. CJ's Butcher Boy Burgers. When all you do are burgers, they have to be the best. And Bubba, we just mentioned that Connor Noland is on the mid-season watch list for the Golden Spikes Award. Here's a little bit of trivia for you. Who was the last Arkansas player on the mid-season watch list for the Golden Spikes? Ooh, that'd have to be what, Ben Attendee? Oh. Well, you know, most people would think it would be most people would think it would be Kevin Copps because he won the award last year. He was not on either the preseason or the midseason watch list 
for the Golden Spikes, the last Razorback who was on that list was Isaiah Campbell in 2019. Yeah, yeah, cops didn't get going until until about this time of year. So, but Connor, hey, Connor's been awesome. Matt, I tell you, his start Friday night, he gave up four hits. Two of those are infield singles. Uh, one was a blooper down the left field line. Really, the only hard hit ball was a breaking ball uh, that that he hung the tanner that he hit over the fence. Other than that, I mean, he was just unbelievable. Had just just kept making pitches all night. So it was, it was a, another great start for Connor Nolan. That's twice now that he has had a career type outing against Mississippi State. You know, when he was a freshman, I know you remember this game, Bubba. He threw seven and two-third scoreless innings against Mississippi State, and then he threw seven innings against them last week. Those are the only two starts he's made against Mississippi State. Of course, they didn't play in 2020. Last year, he was injured when the Razorbacks went to Starkville. But that in two starts now against Mississippi State, 14 and two-third innings. He hasn't walked a batter in either of those games. 11 strikeouts has been really efficient with his pitches. And, and you think that there's something sometimes to that kind of matchup that maybe Mississippi State is such an aggressive hitting team that it plays into the hands of a pitcher who's like Connor Nolan, who really likes to pitch to contact. Oh, I think so. I think there's definitely something to that. that you know, Connor throws strikes. And if you're a strike thrower against an aggressive team, you feed off of that, their aggressiveness. And he can throw that, that two seam up there and get a first pitch ground ball, but he can also go to the slider and the cutter. The thing that Connor said Friday night was he didn't have that cutter going. So he used primarily fastball curveball, but he can kind of change the, the axis on on the breaking ball, Matt, which makes him, you know, I don't want to compare him to Kevin Copps, but I jokingly when when Connor Nolan came up to the booth, I said that was kind of Copps like because he can throw one breaking ball that's got a little more depth on it. You can throw another one that's a little more horizontal break. And so he shows them that one with a little bit more horizontal break, throws it a little bit harder. Then he comes back with that one that's a couple miles an hour slower that's got more depth on it. He gets the strikeout with that. They swing over the top of it. And so boy, he just really had it going Friday night, but he just He's got good stuff, but he knows how to pitch, and and nothing phases him out there on the mound. Hagen Smith had a nice start on Saturday. He goes six innings against the Bulldogs. He had a rough start in the game. I'm talking about a rough start to the game. He walked three consecutive batters with one out in the first inning, and Matt Hobbs had to go out and talk to him. They said that his heart rate was just almost out of this world, uh, that, that he was so amped up and, and ready to go in that game. It kind of reminded me of, of what happened with him against Stanford back in February, but maybe this goes to show where he's grown as a pitcher in the last five or six weeks. He was able to recompose himself and, and get deep into that game. Well, that's what's impressive, to walk the first three batters, you know, and then you, min- you, you minimize the damage, you give up one run. Uh, and then you're able, after that, you don't walk another batter. That's pretty impressive for a freshman to regain his composure. But then also, you know, Dave Van Horn to stay with him. I don't know if you remember when uh, it might have been 2019, Isaiah Campbell had a couple of games where I don't think I don't think DVH let him get out of the first inning. They, he didn't have that chance to work through some struggles early on, but they trust. Taken Smith, they left him out there and he worked through it and ended up throwing six really good innings, you know, giving up three runs. And so uh, his only three batters he walked were the first three of the game. After that, he was pretty good. And so that says a lot about a freshman to be able to get, regain his composure and get back on track and, 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 and carry on after that first inning. Jackson Wiggins goes five innings on Sunday. I think we're all kind of surprised that he came out when he did because his pitch count was still – relatively low 80 pitches that he had thrown Dave Van Horn said that when Matt Hobbs had gone out and spoken with him in the fifth inning he asked him how he was feeling and Wiggins said something along the lines of just okay and usually the comment might be pretty good or something and so they kind of took that choice of words to mean that it wasn't that he wasn't really having the day that they thought he might have and so they take him out and, and they go with the bullpen for the rest of that game what were your thoughts on Wiggins performance uh, I didn't think he had his best stuff, but Jackson without his best stuff is still really good. You look at his line, five, five innings, four hits, two runs, you know, one walk, five Ks. You know, he, he was still really good. But you're right on that comment. I, I don't know Jackson Wiggins very well. You know, I'll get his, I don't get as much chance to talk to the pitching staff as I do the hitters. But for me, if, if I ask a kid how he is and he's like, oh, well, I'm OK, it's time to come out of the game. You know, I need I need a little bit more of an answer. But, you know, I know I know Jackson's a laid back, 
you know, guy, nothing phases him. Uh, so maybe, maybe his okay is different than your, your standard. Okay. But yeah, I, I, uh, that's not a good enough answer for me. I want to know. Yeah, I'm good coach. I got it. Yeah. Don't I, leave me in. I'm, I'm good. You know, I need, I need something a little bit more than, you know, what he said, but, uh, but with that being said though, we had a fresh bullpen, you know, we had everyone ready to go. I mean, Evan was fresh, Zebulon, you know, Brady Tiger was fresh. I mean, so we were in good shape bullpen wise. So, you know, and plus your little quick turnaround this week. So that, I wonder if that had something to do with it. You know, Jackson at 80 pitches, he's going to have a quicker turnaround this week. You know, Hagen Smith only threw 87. So he's going to be good to go. Um, you know, Connor Nolan threw 104 pitches, but, None of it wasn't a stressful. None of those innings were really stressful for Connor Nolan. That was a that was a pretty easy 104 pitches. So I think he's going to be able to bounce back Thursday and be good to go on Thursday and and uh, as well as the rest of the staff. But the starters have been really, really impressive. It's been a long time since I can remember. I'd say a long time. It, it's been a while since I remember Arkansas having three starters who could consistently go this deep into the games they ended up throwing 18 innings between the three starters against Mississippi state. I thought they pitched pretty well, six runs in those 18 innings. That's a, was that a 3.00 ERA, 11 hits, just four walks between the three starters. And as you mentioned, three of those were to the first four hitters by Hagen Smith on Saturday night. And something that I've been kind of tracking here lately, Bubba is how many more outs Arkansas starters get than the other team against Mississippi State Arkansas starters get 54 outs Mississippi State's only gets 32 against Kentucky they had 30 more outs than Kentucky starters against Missouri they had 10 more outs than the Tigers starters in all nine of Arkansas's SEC games Nolan Smith and Wiggins have either matched or exceeded the number of outs uh, that their counterpart has had from the other side uh, this is really really rare stuff that I think we're seeing from Arkansas's pitching staff, at least from a starting perspective, how they're able to match and, and pitch better than whoever they're going against nine straight games. Yeah. And going in, do you remember everyone talking about the weakness of this team was going to be starting pitching who was going to start? You know, I think, I think Hagen Smith was penciled in as a starter, you know, Jackson possibly is that son. We weren't sure about Friday, but there were a lot of question marks about, you know, who our starting rotation was going to be, and they've been spectacular. And so that's good to see. Mississippi State's one of the better hitting teams in the SEC, even though their batting average doesn't show it. Uh, you know, their, their batting average is maybe down toward the, the bottom of the league. But, you know, you look at some of the power numbers, they're, they're one of the better hitting teams in the league. You know, for the weekend, though, and, and one more thing on Mississippi State, I, I think that their hitters – a lot like Arkansas's hitters have not hit their stride yet this year. I think that there's a lot more left in the tank for that lineup. But going back to the last weekend's numbers, Mississippi State was held to a 171 batting average for the weekend, Bubba. That's over 100 points below their season average. And you look at what they've done from a run production standpoint, uh, they scored at Georgia 31 runs in 27 innings. Against Alabama the week before, they had gotten 17 runs in 28 innings. Against Arkansas, they scored 11 runs in 30 innings. And if you go to regulation, you know, you take those extra innings away on Sunday and you look at earned runs, they only had seven earned runs in regulation against the Razorbacks for the weekend. Uh, that's, that's winning pitching right there for Arkansas. Yes, it is. That 171 average is really impressive. But you can compliment – I mean. It, Hats off to the guys going out there on the mound and getting it done, but also you got to give a lot of credit to Matt Hobbs, Zach Barr, uh, the staff, you know, Clay Goodwin, all the guys that go out and do the scouting, you know, because you, you talk about the shifts and how many outs we hit into because of Mississippi State shifts. We're doing the same thing, and there were a lot of balls that we got to that if we don't shift, we don't make that play. So, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of preparation going in there, but ultimately those guys got to go out there and get on the mound and get those outs. And and even our bullpen, I I thought our bullpen was good, Matt. You know, people are still criticizing the bullpen, but if you look on the weekend, we went 12 innings, seven hits, five runs, three walks, 14 Ks out of our mm -hmm. bullpen. That's pretty good work against, like you said, a really good hitting Mississippi State team. Prior to that last inning by Cole Ramage, Bubba, the, the Arkansas relievers had given up one earned run in 11 innings against Mississippi State. That's, uh, that's, that's incredible, I thought, by the bullpen. And I think Cole Ramage kind of gets a raw end of the deal. You know, I mean, he's, he's doing the best he can out there. And the end of the game Sunday, 
I think overshadows the fact that on Friday he came in and got three outs, didn't have a base runner at all in those. And then he came in in a, a really uh, leveraged situation in the 11th inning against Brad Cumbus, one of Mississippi State's best power pit hitters. And he got him out in the 11th inning. He had done his job up until that point. You know, it's just a matter of walks and hit by pitches are going to kill you. And then you do that against the bottom of the order and you've got Mississippi State's best hitters coming up. It was just a, a bad sequence of events for him. Well, you talk about the, the when he came in and faced Cumbus, he struck him out on three curveballs. And and really just overmatch Brad Cumbus, and and it was a huge situation to get to get out of that inning for the third the third out of that inning. He starts out the next inning, uh, gets an out, and then hits the hits the next batter on a first pitch fastball in, and and that kind of changed things for him. After that, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a walk. Well, he gave up a line out to left. Um, and then a walk, and then a base hit, and then another base hit on a curveball. A couple of them weren't hit hard, but you know, you're right. I think it's been kind of tough luck for him. He's come in at times and made really good pitches. Other times he's made good pitches and given up some weak contact, and every once in a while he just makes a mistake, and, and a guy will hit it over the fence. But, I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's the nature of the game. When you're pitching at the end of a game, it, those outs are hard to get. They're really hard to get, especially in SEC games, especially you get to Sunday – and and we're fighting for a sweep. The other team's fighting just to get one win. Those out harder and harder to get. I think Cole's been in some really tough situations, and I think for the most part, you know, he's he's done a pretty good job. You know, I think that the moments where he doesn't get it done, you know, whether that be the the wild pitch sequence and the walk against Missouri, or the you know the, the sequence the other day against Mississippi State, I think for some reason people remember those a lot more than they do the situations where he has come in and, and gotten the job done. Is he the best relief pitcher they have? Absolutely not. Uh, you know, but I, I think that he's better than a lot of the other relievers. You know, one of the things that you hear Dave Van Horn talk about is that he thinks they have some freshmen who have better stuff than the pitchers who they're running out there. He said, but right now with a lot of those freshmen, what they're seeing is a lot of fear and panic in their eyes, and they don't want to put them out there in those leverage situations. And so that's why you see some pitchers like Cole Ramage or Zebulon Vermillion or Evan Taylor who have been in those situations a lot more, and they may not always get the job done, but the thing that they like about them is that they've got the heart rate, they've got the mentality, and they've got the experience more so than, they, than some of these younger pitchers. Right. And, and there's a, there's a lot to be said with that. You, you look at how Cole Ramage came in and like I said, threw the three curveballs to Brad Cummins and struck him out in a high leverage situation. That was huge right there. Now the three pass balls, I, I had a bunch of people ask me throughout the week about the three pass balls in a row or wild pitches in a row, as they're called, uh, you know, at Missouri. Well, if we're at Baltimore, Walker, that doesn't happen. Michael Turner blocks those pitches. I, I've, I went back and watched them again. And those weren't horrible pitches. They were just curveballs in the dirt. He's got a lot of spin on his breaking ball. And, 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 and you're, it's coming off a turf in Columbia. And so it's bouncing weird off that turf. And that's at Ball and Walker. Those balls are blocked and no one's having that conversation. But, you know, the fact that it was three wild pitches in a row and a runner gets on, walks, goes around the bases on three consecutive wild pitches, everyone makes a big deal about that. I think it's really overblown, though. Uh, and you attribute that to the turf. Um, but yeah, I think he's done a good job, and 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 I agree. When it comes to some of our young guys, I mean, we got some guys that are really good. You look at Nick Moulton came in last night and threw, and you know, it has really good stuff. But boy, he, you just feel like the game speeds up on some of the younger guys, and that's what makes Brady Tiger what he's doing more, even more impressive. Uh, Hagen Smith, it's so impressive to see him be able to slow the game down, and it's tough as a freshman and. Man, I was there, too. I, I remember how fast the game would go at times. And uh, you just got to be able to slow it down. And that's why that's why these midweek games are so important is to get some of those younger guys out there and just get them some experience. And I think the more times they get out there on the mound, I think the better off they are. You know, we talked about Peyton Stovall at the plate. Bases loaded, one out. You know, he swings at a few pitches out of the zone and strikes out. Uh, next time up, same situation. Uh lays off a couple pitches, gets a slider, hits a, hits a rocket to the first baseman. So that one situation made him better. And that's why it's going to be with the guys, the pitchers on the staff. Every time they get out, there's another chance for them to grow and get better. Arkansas had zero wild pitches against Mississippi State, which goes to what you were saying, that whenever they're playing on a turf infield, 
it, it makes a big difference versus whenever they're playing on the infield that they're used to playing with. You know, they were able to get some pitchers in against UCA on Tuesday night, Bubba. I think one of the things that has hurt this team a little bit has been the fact that they've had these midweek games canceled the last couple of weeks. It was against Omaha in Kansas City a couple of weeks ago. Then they didn't get to play the Wednesday game against UALR last week because of rain. These are the games where, I mean, it's kind of like the proving grounds for your younger pitchers. And they're the games where the coaches are really evaluating whether or not they think that the guy can give them some late innings on the weekend. Absolutely. And you look at last night as a perfect example. You know, I mentioned Nick Moulton. You know, he, he wasn't able to get it out. He threw some really good pitches, but he just he, he came out. And I was I was really hoping Dave would leave him in there and let him try to work through it. But you know, they saw what they needed to see and they got him out of there. I tell you who looked great last night. Mark Adamiak came in one inning, three strikeouts. He had that cut fastball going. His fastball was 94. To 95 but his cut fastball was 89 90 and boy he was he was spotting that thing up and that's just a dirty pitch you know I thought Elisha Tress looked good last night uh, it was good to see Isaac Bracken back on the mound again last night he's he gave a couple of hits but I uh, struck out a couple of guys he's a guy that I think is going to be a, a, a big piece I mean there's still there's so many unanswered questions I think right now Ben, and I wish we could play more games so those guys could get more work. I jokingly said last night on the air with Phil is we almost need JV games during the midweek against other competition. So these guys can go out and get their innings in uh, where they're not having to pitch to their own batters. It's different when you're pitching to your own batters in a scrimmage mm -hmm. versus pitching to another team. And it's like you almost need those JV games to say, OK, here, Nick Moulton, go out there. Nick Griffin, go out there and pitch and, and let's let's see what you can do against against other competition. And they're just not getting that chance. And by the way, Nick Griffin, it was good to see him back on the mound last night. He actually looked good. Uh, he made some really good pitches. And so I know why they're so excited about it him I've seen him kind of grow up around this area or in central Arkansas pitching and, and the guy's going to be really good Pat once once it all comes together for him he's definitely got the stuff and uh so it's exciting I, I get excited when I get to see those guys come in and, and pitch when you're pitching against your own hitters they know your stuff and, and they're going to hit you really well it's kind of hard to you know, get a feel for for how good things are going in those situations. Uh, you mentioned Adamiak. I think that he looks a lot more comfortable in a relief role than he does in a starting role. He hasn't looked real comfortable in those starting roles. And you'll hear coaches talk a lot of times about the relievers or, or some pitchers are better in a relief role because they don't have to think about it. They just got five or 10 minutes to get ready. And then all of a sudden they're in the game where if you're a starting pitcher, you got to sleep on it the night before. And, and sometimes it can become more mental on you, but I think Adamiak, Starks, Trest, Griffin, Bracken, like you mentioned, uh, those are all pitchers who are going to have to uh, fill in that bullpen toward the end of the season. I wanted to talk real quick about Arkansas's defense. They made some great defensive plays again in the last week. I think about the double play after uh, kind of a controversial call in the fifth inning that got him out of that with the bases loaded. And one of the things I've looked at, Bubba, is that Arkansas is number four nationally right now with a 986 fielding percentage. And when you kind of look at the top of the coaches poll, and there is a lot of correlation between teams that are winning a lot of games and teams that field really well. I mean, look at this. Uh, Tennessee ranked number one. They're 22nd in fielding. Arkansas ranked number two, they're fourth in fielding. Virginia ranked number three, they're eighth in fielding. Texas Tech number four, they're 15th in fielding. Oregon State fifth, third in fielding. Texas number six, fifth in fielding. Oklahoma State number seven, they are the best fielding team in the country. You go on down the list, Notre Dame, Florida, they're ranked, they're in the top 10 in fielding. Uh, maybe more so than any other metric, it's how you field and the teams that are winning games are teams that don't beat themselves with errors in the field. I think so. And look, I, I talk hitting all the time, Matt, and, and, and I love hitting. I love hitting mechanics. I love the matchup of a pitcher versus a hitter. Talking about the pitch plane coming in, getting on plane with your bat. I, I love all those things. I can talk about it all day. And, and, but everyone always says pitching and defense wins. And if you look at what you just broke down, you're, you're right. And think of it. Look at the Razorbacks. When a team makes an error against us, 
we typically score that inning. If you give us an extra out in an inning, we make it, we make you pay for it. And, and that's why those teams that aren't making the errors are at the top of that heap right there is because they're not giving those teams those extra outs. And it, it, it goes a long way. And, and, and at the end of the year, there's another thing that always, I always look at is strikeouts teams that strike out. I know I'm kind of getting off topic here. Teams that don't strike out as a team, are typically the teams that are that are in the mix at the end of the year, also. So those two things kind of go together. I wanted to ask you about the uh, the catch no catch situation from Sunday's game. You know, we mentioned Scott Klein had a good night behind the plate on Friday night. He was the second base umpire on Sunday. He was the crew chief uh, for the entire weekend. This is an umpire who you see in Omaha uh, quite often. You see him working a lot of SEC tournament games, SEC tournament championship type events. Uh, he, he had a bad mistake in that fifth inning where Lane Forsyth hits it. Braden Webb makes a diving attempt, a great attempt at, at catching the ball, but he traps it, and it looks like a trap in real time. But Klein calls him out, and because he calls him out, when they go to replay, they have to award second base to that first base runner who likely would have been forced out had they just allowed the play to, to move on because he kind of retreated back to first base because it looked like Webb was going to catch the ball. Uh, that's one of those situations, number one, where I think it's a bad rule. I think that there has to be uh, some room for common sense in these uh, rulings after replay. And number two, if you're the second base umpire right there, you've got to get that call right because that could have cost Arkansas a run in a really tight Sunday game. There's a lot of times, Matt, when I'm up in the booth, I just want to take my headset off and say what I really think. And that was one of those times I really needed a mute button to say what I really thought about that call. I thought that was a terrible call. Uh, I think the, the whole review, I think the whole thing stinks, to be honest with you. Um, first of all, you could tell from the booth, Braden Webb did not catch that ball. It was obvious. You can look at the center fielder's reaction when he dove and he rolled over. He didn't catch the ball. He threw so it right into second he base. It. He knew he didn't catch the yeah. ball. Yeah. He knew it. And Klein even called it late. It's not like it was an immediate call. He waited late. Cumbus had already started going back to first base. He didn't see, he, he thought he caught it. He didn't see the umpires called it outside. I mean, he just, he started going back on his own and you can see it when they showed the replay of, you could see the whole play in front of you, what happened. So like you said, common sense should prevail at some point. I get it. it a rule is a rule, but it's a stupid rule. Someone needs to, do, to throw that out and just have a little common sense prevail. Cause it's 2022 right now. We, we could see the whole play on the review. What happened? Um, it should have been a force out at second and, you know, runner at first and one out instead of, you know, runners at first and second, nobody out. I think it's a stupid rule. I think the whole play kind of sucked, to be honest with you. It reminds me a little bit of that. Uh, you remember that Auburn Arkansas football game a couple of years ago where Bo Nick spikes it backward and it should have been a fumble. You know, if, if they're the, the officials, I think are taught this, but it doesn't always happen on the field. Just let the play play out. And if you're unsure, let it go. Let replay take care of it. Don't make the wrong call on the field. And he made the wrong call on the field there. Absolutely. And, but once you make the wrong call, isn't that why we have review to get I think the, the right problem call? is that once you make the wrong call, then, you know, say like with the, the fumble issue, you got whistles blowing and then all of a sudden the play is dead. The same thing goes here for this runner who gets kind of caught between first and second base. Once he sees that out sign, you know, it's, you, you put him in a, in a kind of a no win situation. Yeah, but if you watch the review, Cumbus was going back to first before he saw that. I agree outside. with you there. Yeah. Um, so once again, there should be an asterisk there saying, well, if he sees the, <laughs> which I don't know <laughs> who decides whether the runner sees the out call or not. Yeah. But from my vantage point, Cumbus never saw Scott Klein call out. He just thought it was a catch and went back to first. And so I, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those, it's another one of those things that just baffles me. Some of these rules that really need to be rethought and I don't know who makes them. And, and, and I get why some of them are in place, but this is a stupid rule go away. I think that's why the the catch no catch rule reads the way it does is because there's just really no great way to address it massage envy has been voted the best day spa and best massage in all of northwest arkansas great therapists and estheticians go along with a new service that i am truly excited about rapid tension relief uses a special tool that will melt the tension and soreness away 
Trust me, you will not be disappointed in the results. I highly recommend this feature along with a total body stretch assisted stretch program. Whether you are competing at a high level or just want to relax, these services are for everyone. Massage, rapid tension relief, total body stretch, deep muscle treatment massage, you choose. Or you can try any combination of those. So the next time you're feeling tight, make sure to call my friends at Massage Envy. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. Grease Pig, this is Mike. Coming in hot, so I can just stay in my vehicle during my oil change? That's right. The Grease Pig wants to help keep you safe, so now you can stay in your vehicle during your oil change. These guys are working like a pig crew. That's part of our 17-point inspection, where we check your belts and hoses, we check and fill all your fluids, and offer full repair on all vehicles. And of course, we use Castrol products. Why do I smoke coffee? You know our waiting room is still open. And give up front row seats to my own oil change? No, thank you. You're doing awesome. Mike, I think I'm making them uncomfortable. Get into the Grease Pig, your local automotive specialist for over 20 years. Welcome back to the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. Let's take a look at the week ahead, presented by Grease Pig. Arkansas and Florida will play three times this weekend in Florida at the new Florida Ballpark in Gainesville. Game time's Thursday at 5 o'clock, Friday at 5.30, and Saturday at noon. All of those times are central times. On Thursday, the game will be on SEC Network. Friday and Saturday's games will be on SEC Network Plus. The week ahead is brought to you by the Grease Pig. For 20 years, they have specialized in serving UA students, faculty, and staff with two locations in Fayetteville on College Avenue and MLK Boulevard. The Grease Pig has experience for all your repair needs and, of course, complete service oil changes staffed with ASE certified master technicians. They also provide tires and alignment services their location on College Avenue. The Grease Pig, it's all about taking care of you, and they're a proud supporter of the Whole Hog Baseball podcast. We're joined now by Mike Rooney of ESPN and D1Baseball.com. Mike was in Fayetteville last Friday for the Razorbacks game against Mississippi State, the 8-1 to victory for the Razorbacks in game one of that series. And he joins us now to talk about it and the rest of the SEC. Mike, we appreciate you coming on. You got it, Matt. My pleasure, man. Great, great to see you last week and uh, fun to talk about the Hogs. So this was your first time back to Fayetteville, I gather, since 2009? Well, I think... I think I've been back once in between, but the game got rained out. Okay. So, um, yeah, like they they were, if you recall a couple years ago, they were supposed to play Texas Tech in a midweek game, which was going to be awesome. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then whether I had the Wednesday game. Yeah. But hey, the 2009, you know, I, 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 you know, I'm a college baseball nerd. I love it. And uh, so obviously Arkansas is one of my favorite places because of the passion that the fan base has for baseball. And so in 2009, when I was back there, I mean, that was one versus one, you know, that was the Mike Leak, Arizona state team, Jason Kipnis, Cole Calhoun. Uh, Mm -hmm. And I I tell that story to people all the time that it was a Wednesday night in the middle of the year and, you know, 12,000 people stayed till the final pitch. It was a six, five game. If my memory serves. And I just was blown away that here, you know, I looked down from the radio booth and, um, every seat's taken and it's, you know, it's a weekday night. And um, so, and then coming back this weekend and getting to see the player development center and uh, yeah, it's just awesome. I mean, Arkansas baseball, it's a, it's a golden age for the program right now. For those who don't know, he was uh, with Arizona state's radio crew when the sun devils came to Fayetteville for a midweek series in 2009. And in that one, like you mentioned, Arizona state was ranked number one at one poll, Arkansas was number one in the other. Uh, that was a really neat, uh, neat event. Uh, what were your thoughts watching Arkansas on Friday night when you called the game against Mississippi State? Yeah, lots of thoughts. Like, um, I thought that, uh, you know, it's, it's not the 2021 team. And that's an unfair bar for this team to be held to. Um, you know, that 2021 team, to me, Matt, is one of the best college baseball teams I've seen in a decade. But, I, but there's so much to like. Um, about this team and you know the even though going into the weekend I think Arkansas's record was let's call it 19 and four it was a pretty you know meh 
19 and four. And I think, you know, Arkansas fans would probably, you know, they might agree with me there. I would think where, you know, just the offense was not great. Um, but I, I, I don't know. Let, let me let me not bury the lead here. I, I, there's a lot to like about this team. I, I came away really impressed with the rotation. I, I loved my look at Connor, Connor Noland. I mean, he is he has improved dramatically. Um, I love the way the bullpen sets up where there's three guys that Dave Van Horn and Matt Hobbs can lean on. And then there's a bunch of lottery tickets down there with power arms. Um, I, I, I worry that the offense is not going to be it's just not going to be as good as last year's. Um, but they did show signs of, you know, as the weather warms up, they did hit eight home runs against Mississippi state. Um, I don't know. The offense doesn't feel the same to me. doesn't mean it can't be as good as last year's, but I, it, I'll tell you, Matt, it feels like an Omaha team to me. But why do you say that? You know, cause a lot of people would look at Arkansas and they'd say that the strength of the team is supposed to be their hitting. I mean, what, what are other things that you see about this team that make make them an elite caliber team Bubba and I were talking earlier about fielding and you know we were looking at the you know the top fielding teams in the country and these are the teams that are also kind of at the top of the coaches poll I mean is it the fielding is it something else you see about this team yeah I mean I think the carrying I actually wrote that this week that the carrying tool for this team is that elite defense you know they're fielding 985 and I don't think that's changing but you know they're really strong up the middle the middle Braden Webb is fantastic in center field and you know, I, we know about the infield defense. So, um, yeah, I, I, the, the, that defense is a carrying strength. But I think this pitching staff plays right into the defense. Um, you know, I, what do they call that in football? They say complementary, where, um, you know, like Connor Nolan suffocates the strike zone. You know, he forces contact. Hagen Smith and Jackson Wiggins have really been improved strike throwers. I love the reliability of that bullpen. Uh, you know, you think about Taylor and Vermillion and Tiger. They just feel like they're in a great place. And I feel like there's gonna they're going to build some depth in that bullpen. There's more talent down there that could emerge. So I, I love the, the pitching staff. You know, I, I think deep down last year with the pitching staff, we were all kind of holding our breath. I don't feel like we're holding our breath this year. I feel like there's just, hey, there's a bunch of good options and who's going to be on it that weekend. And I do think the offense, even though I don't like it as much as last year's, you know, there's plenty of talent here. It's an older group. Caden Wallace, I think, is a big leaguer. You know, Robert Moore, Bob Moore, I, you know. I, I, he's, he's going to be fine. You know, I don't know that he's going to be the player he was last year for whatever reason. I don't know why that is, but he'll, he'll keep coming. He's a good player. So I think the offense will be just fine, but I love the dependability of the pitching and the the defense and Hey, the way it's trending right now, someone's going to have to beat Arkansas twice in Fayetteville to keep them from Omaha. And I just, I'm, I, I can't picture that right now. They seem like they play so much better in Fayetteville, Mike. I mean, you know, a couple of these games, they, they played UALR, they played UCA, they're expected to put up big numbers, but you know, they put up pretty good offensive numbers, I thought, against Mississippi State. Not a lot of hits in the games, but I think one of the things that makes this lineup so good is that they're able to get on base without getting hits. I mean, they got 24 hits, but they drew 27 walks against Mississippi State, but they just ended a five-game homestand where they scored 60 runs and had 58 hits at Baumwalker Stadium, they just seem like they play a lot differently offensively when they're at their home park. And I guess that's that's the case for a lot of teams. Yeah, and I, I think it's I think there's two sides to that coin too, Matt. Like I think not only is Arkansas play well at Baumwalker, but I think it, it's a hard place for opponents to play too. You know, it's a very intimidating atmosphere. It's a raucous crowd. And um yeah, I, I it seem like the power numbers are down for Arkansas. I think that's going to help them in the postseason, you know, whereas last year's team, I don't want to say reliant on the home run, but certainly that was a major part of their offense. I think this offense will end up being um, more uh, versatile than that. You know, I wanted to go back to something you said a second ago about Robert Moore. You know, you're seeing this too with uh, Brady Slavens. All of those guys are draft eligible and they're all, you know, this is probably their draft year. Do you see that with players? I mean, when you were coaching, did you see that with players when, that would be their draft year that sometimes that would maybe not allow them to, to play as freely as they had in the years previous to that. Yeah, no, yeah, no question. I mean, you know, you hear the term among scouts, they call it draft ditis and um, you know, and Hey, by the way, like Robert Moore could also, I heard a scout say this the other day, like, Hey, Robert Moore could do a Judd Fabian. Remember he's young for the grade. So if yeah. he doesn't like where he gets picked, he could come back and be, you know, right on target next year. So 
Um, yeah. Hey, I remember back in the day at Arizona State, Dustin Pedroia's junior year, he thrived, right? It didn't bug him at all. Um, we had another player on that team, Jeff Larish, who also was a starter for Team USA, where he had some injuries that affected him early in the season. And then the pressure of the draft really piled up on him. So, you know, there's a lot of things that can happen. And I, I, I say it this way to other people, Matt, like my wife, you know, was a CPA back in her career. And I say, hey, what if somebody came up to you and, and said, hey, for the next four months, if you're like the best CPA in America, I'll give you $6 million. It would be hard to sleep for those next four months, right? Yeah. Like, yep. and, and these are 20 year olds that we're saying this to. So yeah, I think the draft thing is a real thing. Hey, and I've heard people around the program say that the weather has been awful for Arkansas so Terrible. far and yep. you know, that affects offense. So um, I, I think there's a lot of factors. It's, it's like anything in life. It's usually not just one thing it's death by a thousand cuts but again i don't think they're going to put up the i, I know they're not going to hit 109 home runs that's not going to happen like they did last year but i do i think this is going to be a very good postseason offense you saw connor nolan in person you mentioned it a minute ago uh just i wonder if you could elaborate on what you saw from him though friday night and and how he looks different to you from past seasons oh man it was just awesome i mean it was uh i i wrote a piece for d1 baseball com this week and a big part of the piece was about connor noland and i just um it, the, the arkansas social media account the twitter account had a great tweet they just said connor noland dot 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 that is the tweet and that's what i felt like i mean he was the star of the show and you know my memory of connor noland is he shows up in 2019 he's a football quarterback on scholarship i didn't realize he made 19 starts that, that year but it just didn't feel um like awesome right like it, it just felt like an athlete who was surviving and I did notice that they lost Arkansas lost six of Connor's last seven starts in 2019 and that was an Omaha team um, but and then 2020 was off to a good start and then missed a start and then 20, 2021 never got off the you know just off the rails from the get-go so you know just when you think about Connor Nolan his reputation as a football player who throws strikes and man to be Friday night in the SEC that's not a very you know, intimidating resume. But I mean, to me, Matt, he was awesome. I mean, that breaking ball is a difference maker. I've never seen it look like that before. And he just, he, he, it, it's almost like, I, it reminds me of Baylor basketball last year in the title game where they just were in Gonzaga's face from the jump and it changed the whole game. Connor Nolan's breaking ball, just he's in your face with it from pitch one. And, and the other offense is kind of on their heels. And then, you know, his fastball, he didn't throw a fastball under 90 miles an hour. Now he never got above 93, but he just, it's strike, strike, strike. And he just, he's got the other team on their heels. He, you know, I wrote this, he's the perfect Friday night guy for this team because it's attack mode from pitch one. And it really, I, I felt like it really impacted Mississippi state. Arkansas is going to play Florida this week, Thursday night. They'll see Hunter Barco. Some people think he might be the best pitcher in the SEC. What have you seen from him? And, and I wonder what your thoughts are on Florida. Uh, they're off to a little bit of a rough start right now, three and six in SEC play. They got swept by Georgia last week. Uh, how good is this Florida team? Yeah, I, you know, Florida is interesting. I mean, obviously, if you think about the decade of the 2010s and you want to do a program of the decade, you have two choices. It's either Florida, who went to Omaha seven times, which is crazy, and won one national title, or Vandy to Omaha, I think five times, but they won two national titles. So, um, you know, obviously we know who Florida is in baseball. Um, I, last year's team, not, you know, they had talent, but not chemistry. Very choppy season. They, they got bounced out of their own home regional, and they came into the year the consensus number one. I like the vibe around Florida's team better this year. They kind of have that old Florida competitiveness and, you know, focus on winning. They, they really understand winning baseball, but I would tell you there's a lot of new faces on this team, um, especially in, in the bullpen, especially on the pitching staff. So I still think Florida is very dangerous. Obviously it's been odd to see them lose five of, of their last six in SEC play. But um, they're still very dangerous. I just think it's a young team. It, it's kind of a little bit of a program reset. Um, they are a little bit vulnerable at the back of the bullpen. They do not have power arms at the back. But yeah, you know, and you mentioned Hunter Barco can can you know, he can go toe to toe with anybody on Friday nights. Six five lefty, big velocity, 
hard angle, tough on hitters, um, and, you know, third year in the league. So, you know, he's a veteran. They've got Judd Fabian uh, back at the plate. Uh, How good is he this year? Yeah, just, I mean, if you look at it, Judd Fabian, you speak about draft, or, you know, you mentioned draftitis, Matt. Hey, you could argue Judd Fabian had a little bit of that um, in, you know, last year in the first half. If you look at his second half, he was a much better player, and it feels like that is carried forward. The thing I like about Judd Fabian is he's got some skills that always play. He's an elite defensive center fielder. I mean, just one of those guys that when you look up, he's already on the move. He catches everything. He's a good thrower from the outfield. Uh, And, you know, his power is he's the guy where you're always thinking about where is he in the lineup? He can leave the yard at any time. And, you know, he's made much more contact this year, taken more walks. So um, he's he's a very dangerous player and he affects both sides of the baseball. How do you think this series goes this weekend for Arkansas? It's, 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 a, it's an interesting deal because, you know, Arkansas has got this quick turnaround. They played Friday, Saturday, Sunday last week against Mississippi State, whereas Florida, you know, they've got something to prove coming off the Georgia series, and they were able to play Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Do you think that makes a difference when you've got one team that's pitching on normal rest versus another one whose pitchers are going to go on six days? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly can make a difference. It really makes it it makes a tough decision for the Arkansas coaching staff. And um, so, you know, it'd be interesting to see, do they slide everybody up? I mean, the good news in college baseball is even when you're on six days rest, it's an additional day that they get in, you know, than than professional baseball. You're still on a weekly routine and it just means that you'd get an extra day the following week. So I my guess is that Arkansas, that Dave Van Horn, Matt Hobbs would probably just slide everybody up. Um, it's not like any of these kids have thrown a ton of innings. You know, they're, they're, none of them are even averaging six innings a start when, you know, speaking of Nolan and Smith and Wiggins. Um, so I, I think the, the more pressing thing is it's always hard in the SEC to play a team whose back is against the wall. And there's a little bit of that for Florida right now. I mean, Florida is, um, you know, they, they, they're going to need to draw a line in the sand this weekend. So I think that's a challenge for Arkansas. I do think Arkansas is the better team, but I also think they're going to have their hands full this weekend. Well, they've got to play Florida, too, who watched Arkansas celebrate on its own field last year when they won the SEC right. championship. I think those kinds of moments, they they teams remember that. Uh, you know, I thought that we saw that with Mississippi State. You know, certainly in their comments leading up to the series against Arkansas, they remembered being swept by Arkansas at Duty Noble last year. Now, obviously, Arkansas won the series this year, uh, but the teams remember that stuff, Mike. Yeah, no, no. I mean, they're college kids, right? Like, there's no question they remember that stuff. And now they get over it a lot quicker than we do as adults, but they do, you know, that they, 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 there will be fun. Although I would say, and I know Dave Van Horn's been quoted, I've, I've, I've seen his interviews on this topic um, this year, but these are, these are two programs that, that have a lot of similarities, very similar styles. I would be surprised if it's a chippy series. I, that's just really kind of not in the DNA of these two teams. Um, they, they, you know, these are just two programs that, um, you know, play at a very, very high level and have very high expectations. And I just, I sense that both programs are very focused on winning baseball games. They're not as focused on the, you know, the banter and the chippiness. So yeah, they, it should be fun. I, I enjoy it when these two teams get together because th- these are, these are, you know, two of the elite programs in America. Well, I think sometimes some of that off-field stuff can carry over about how the coaching staffs feel about each other. Uh, Dave Van Horn and Kevin O'Sullivan are, are very good professional friends, and, and I think you see that come through in their interviews when they talk about each other. Uh, real quick, Mike, I wanted to ask you just a couple of questions about the SEC. First, about Mississippi State. Are they underachieving based on their talent? Because I know they lost Landon Sims, but what I saw for three games in Fayetteville this weekend was a team that still looks like they've got a lot of really, really good players. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more on this, the second part of the statement where, you know, you look at Mississippi State and, man, they look the part. I mean, Logan Tanner, their catcher, is a big leaguer, right? Hunter Hines is a future star. I think that the bottom line for Mississippi State, though, is, you know, uh, if, if you talk to Scott Foxhall, their pitching coach, before the season in the fall and said, line up your top eight pitchers, well, four of them aren't available right now. And so I think, you know, and, and when one of them is Logan Sims, who you could argue is the best arm in America, um, that, that's a big problem. So I think, I think for Mississippi State, they, they have played a very tough schedule, too. You know, it was an unusually 
difficult non-conference schedule. And, um, you know, the pitching has affected them big time. Uh, obviously, losing a Rowdy Jordan and a Tanner, Tanner Allen like that, you know, you're changing the you're, you're that's a big void in your clubhouse and who's going to step forward. So I still I think Mississippi State is going to have a very choppy ride from here until the end of the season. I do think they're going to be a team. If I had to guess, they're going to be a team that's kind of sweating it on selection Monday. But I, I do. They have they have postseason talent. It's just a matter of. Um, you know, that they, 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 they're playing uphill a little bit right now and, and, um, they've not put themselves in pole position for sure. I could see them making the postseason. I could also see them missing it. Is Tennessee as good as, as they look? True. Oh my gosh. I mean, it's just, it's remarkable. It's, um, it'll be so interesting. You know, I, I don't think the sec is quite as, um, formidable this year as it is in years past. I, I think the middle tier of teams in the SEC, there's a lot of teams that are just unsettled. Injuries have had a lot to do with that. So I think that helps Tennessee. But yeah, I mean, we're, we're now having conversations. Are they Oregon State 2017 who showed up in Omaha 54 and four? I mean, if you look at everything about Tennessee, it's insanity. If you look at their rotation, if you look at how many home runs they're hitting, you look at the athleticism of their position player group. If you look at the the depth of their bullpen, you look at a Ben Joyce, who's really not even, he pitches in the midweek. He throws 104 miles an hour. I mean, you, you know, Arkansas fans know Tony Vitello is an incredible recruiter and man, they have some serious momentum going to Knoxville. Last question for you on, on, on the SEC race. It seems like it might be Arkansas and Tennessee. I know there are some other teams. Vanderbilt could potentially get back into it. Georgia is off to a good start at six and three. But from a SEC West perspective, everybody felt like this was going to be the year where it was Arkansas, Ole Miss, Mississippi State, neck and neck right down to the wire. Arkansas has got a three-game lead on those teams. I know it's just three weeks into the season. Uh, obviously, Mississippi State struggling. I wonder about Ole Miss and how formidable of a challenge you think they could be in that division race. Yeah, I, I don't think Ole Miss is going to go anywhere because they're too well coached and they're very talented. But, you know, you can see they're missing Kevin Graham. That injury has impacted them more than I thought. And their pitching, which was a big question mark, has just struggled badly. I mean, you know, Derek Diamond and Drew McDaniel, who are two guys they were hoping were weekend starters. I mean, they're they're throwing mop up time in the midweek right now. So it's it's, you know, Mike Bianco is really in discovery mode in on the pitching staff. I, I think I think Arkansas, the West is theirs to win. I mean, you know, Ole Miss is really struggling on the mound. LSU run prevention in general is a real struggle. Um, you know, Auburn, their offense is very feisty, but, I, you know, they also give up a lot of runs. So I think Arkansas is the cleanest team of the group. They're the most um, complete team, but you know, it's the sec West and just like Arkansas saw last weekend. I mean, they really thoroughly outplayed Mississippi state for the entire weekend, but they only got two wins because that's the way it goes in this division. And Arkansas gets to play Ole Miss, Mississippi state, LSU and Vanderbilt and Fayetteville. That's a, that's a big advantage. Like you said earlier, Sure is, Mike, we appreciate it. Thanks Matt. All right. Our thanks to Mike Rooney. Be sure to listen to his podcast at d1baseball.com. Also check out his reports there. Again, Arkansas and Florida this weekend. Game time's 5 o'clock Thursday on SEC Network, 5.30 Friday on SEC Network Plus, and noon Saturday on SEC Network Plus. This is the first of two straight weeks that the Razorbacks will play Thursday, Friday, Saturday series. The Florida series begins on Thursday because it's got that national television window on Thursday. The LSU series the following week will begin on Thursday because that is the weekend of Easter and a lot of SEC teams are trying to not play on Easter Sunday. Visit wholehogsports.com throughout the weekend as we provide coverage from the Razorbacks games with the Gators. Also, it's a busy time with Razorback basketball. You got coaches leaving, coaches being promoted, players transferring out, players transferring in, new commitments, NBA draft announcements. Come to wholehogsports.com for our latest Razorback basketball coverage. Throughout the basketball offseason, we'll continue to produce the basketball podcast of Mid-America. You can find that and all of our podcasts by searching Whole Hog Radio, that's three words, W-H-O-L-E-H-O-G-R-A-D-I-O on Apple, Spotify, or in most podcast stores. Again, our thanks to Mike Rooney for joining us today. Our thanks also to you for listening. For Bubba Carpenter, I'm Matt Jones. And we'll see you next week on the Whole Hog Baseball Podcast. The proceeding has been a production of WholeHogSports.com. Look for our latest podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store.
and visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.